Well, good evening. It's so hard to get the deans to settle down. So Dean Gregory, are you ready tonight? All right, very good. Well, welcome. My name is Lon Moeller. I'm the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost here at Emory-Riddle Aeronautic University on behalf of President Butler and the university community. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, Presidential Speaker Series event. A special welcome to a member of our Board of Trustees, Mr. David B. O'Malley, whose name's on the college business. For those of you in the college business, Mr. O'Malley, thanks for coming tonight. We are very pleased tonight, though, to be joined by Mr. Gianfranco Panda Betting, and you'll learn tonight how he came up with the nickname Panda. I believe you're gonna talk about that, aren't you, Alex? Mr. Betting's topic is the secret ingredients for a disruptive aviation company, and he'll speak based on his 40 plus years of experience in the aviation industry, and you certainly will hear his passion for the business of aviation. And if you haven't had a chance yet tonight, I would encourage you to look in the lobby of the display, the photographs that Mr. Betting took or has taken there, they are truly spectacular. It's also my pleasure this time to introduce to you our student moderator, Mr. Alexander Prado. Alex is a student in our BS in Aerospace and Occupational Safety program with minors in flight and in business administration. He holds pilot, private pilot license, both in the United States and in Brazil. Alex is the president of the International Society of Air Safety Investigators, is a member of the Latino Pilots Association, and is involved as a student ambassador for our career services office here on campus. Alex is also interned with the Gulfstream Aerospace Corporation. Would you please join me in welcoming our student moderator tonight, Alex Prado. All right, good evening all, and um, thank you for the intro, Provost Muller. I'm truly flattered. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. You know, I've been an avid participant of the Presidential Speaker Series for a pretty long time now, but I always was on that side of the podium. It's a little bit more unnerving to be on this side, but um, I'm grateful for being here. And before we start, um, I want you to spend a little time just thanking for uh, a few people that made this possible, and I'm gonna start with the Board of Trustees and the Board of Directors, especially uh, President Butler, uh, Provost Lon Moeller, um, your assistant, Jessica Otero, and the manager of campus events, April Atkinson. I would like to thank you for all of the support and also the patience with me um, making this event possible. Um, a few students organizations that are here tonight, I would like to greet the Brazilian Student Association that is here the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship that is led by Professor Rami Rahimi. Um, thank you so much for all of your support. Yep, thank you for promoting the event as well. And I will also, also to greet the, all other folks from the International Society of Air Safety Investigators that I'm part of. And uh, we also have a few faculty members. We have um, Dr. Ali Al Jaroudi. He is my uh, professor for my um, aerospace safety management capstone class. Um, thank you for being here. I'm swear I'm not doing this just because I want you to get an A in our class. It's, um, I truly want you to thank you for, for coming over. And I would like to also um, dedicate this speaker series for a past professor of mine by the name of Gary Carter. He was a professor within the aeronautical science department and I was part of his commercial pilot operations class back in spring 2022. And I remember that at the time um, I got COVID and the FAA is really strict when it comes to missing classes, especially with their um, ground courses. Professor Gary Carter went above and beyond to um, help me recover those classes. And I remember his um, effort to do so um, until today. Um, Professor Gary Carter unexpectedly passed away in last summer in 2022, just a couple of months after I completed the class with him and I had the honor to be a student of his last class here at Embry-Riddle. His passing makes me reflect on a quote that was said by a famous French aviator by the name of Antoine de saint exupéry who says, an aviator never dies. He only takes off, flies away, and never comes back. So I do this in memory of Professor Gary Carter. There's also one person that is here tonight that's not um, exactly part of the Embry-Riddle community per se, but is, he is a responsible 
for me being here tonight and for supporting me um, in my academic endeavors here at Emory and that person actually my father and he's sitting right there he actually flown all the way from Brazil just to be here and support the event tonight and also of course to see Panda speaking <laughs> thank you Unbeknownst to many, and I was just talking with our speaker um, before we started, um, this event actually was going to take place around spring 2020, but as we all know, COVID came in and we had to change plans. And here we are roughly three years later. And I look back and I've been with Emberido since 2017, almost over actually half a decade now. I'm 25, so if my maths are right, that. Uh, basically uh, represents a fifth of my life here at Embry-Riddle um, in the fostering and contributing of aviation safety business and its operational endeavors. And it's certainly the case of many of the students that are here tonight with all of Embry-Riddle's variety of majors. You guys also dedicated your lives on being here. But I find that so, so small to the uh, time of experience that our speaker here has tonight because Mr. Batting has over 40 years of experience and his endeavors in the aviation industry started when he was only 12 years old when he turned out to be a gifted painter and artist and he started drawing liveries for a Brazilian airline at the time called Trans Brazil. So the liveries that he drew on paper for the Boeing um, 727s were actually used on that fleet. He proceeded to um, graduate in one of Brazil's most um, respected and renowned universities, University of Sao Paulo in the um, College of Architecture back in 1984. He later graduated with cum laude at IATA's Advanced Airline Marketing Program. Mr. Benny has a really long bio, but one of his um, major positions, he basically did lots of uh, positions related to marketing and executive positions as well, such as chief executive officer, chief marketing officer, director of corporate culture, and a title that I really like, chief creative officer. He proceeded on to found a couple of um, own marketing consulting companies as well, and he consulted for lots of companies, including Lufthansa, TAP Portugal and some private um, aircraft companies as well. In 2008, he proceeded to found Azulinhas Aéreas, uh, which is today's Brazil's flag carrier, connecting more than 170 destinations, including Florida. And it was awarded um, on 2020's world's best airline by customer satisfaction of TripAdvisor. And it's also the most on-time airline of the world um, on 2022. And he founded their airline with David Newman, a really well-known name within the aviation entrepreneurship realm, um, former CEO and founder of JetBlue. Where on 2019, he proceeded to also found a new airline with David Newman by the name of Breeze Airways, which uh, most of us know, using a point-to-point -point business model. Today, Mr. Betting is a publisher and director of the Flap magazine, which is, would be the equivalent of the Fly magazine here in the US with over six years of history archives. He's also a former writer for the Airways and Airliners magazine um, from 1982 until 2018. He speaks natively and fluently Portuguese, English, Spanish, and Italian. He wrote 17 books about commercial aviation. He has 780,000 aircraft pictures, some of which you can see um, right down the hall. If you haven't seen, um, please, save some time after this presentation to take a look. They're really beautiful. He did seven round the world trips, over eight years of international travels. He knows 116 countries, flew on 202 different airlines, 136 different aircraft types and counting. He's also one of the few people that I know that even though he's not a pilot, he logs every flight hour as a passenger on his endeavors. And that's over 9,000 hours on 2,438 flights. He also gave over 60 keynote speeches about aviation and marketing in all of the four continents. It's a pretty long bio. And if you are still not convinced about um, Mr. Batting's passion for aviation, which I highly doubt, Mr. Benning has also, and that's true, a real Lockheed Electra propeller sitting in his room right now as we speak. 
I guess that's enough evidence to say that Mr. Batting shares a lifelong passion for aviation that never vanished, it never even faded. But on the contrary, it just goes stronger. And I can assure you, Mr. Batting, that today here at Emberido, you are in the right place. So without further ado, let's all welcome with a warm round of applause, uh, Mr. Gianfranco Panda Batting. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really thankful for the opportunity for President Baller to Prava Smaller, Jessica, April, and distinguished members of the board. It's truly an honor to be remembered and to be here. Also for the professors and the alumni, uh, you pretty much said it all. I mean, there's nothing much left for me. But anyway, let's go. We're gonna talk about disruptive aviation companies and how to create them. But I'm not gonna talk about only companies. I'm gonna be talking a little bit of attitude, uh, a little bit of the way that I think you guys that are starting off in the business should be thinking, working, the ethics, the moral values, if you will. I mean, what it takes to create something that it, that's not ex ordinary. I mean, get out of the, of the mediocrity, which is the rule of thumb in most industries, including ours. And we're gonna see 10, 10 hints on that. But just before we do, you're gonna be asking, who's this guy? Okay, you did, you did it all, right? So I'm, I'm the one with the hair there. But you, you can easily tell it's fake, right? And, and that was when we uh, tried to celebrate 20 million passengers at the zoo, and we created the moniker, Love is in the Air. So we threw a big party, hippie style. I don't know if I classify as a hippie, but okay. And here are a few pictures of uh, my early life. I, I'm totally mad about aircraft. I have absolutely no recollection whatsoever in my life, which is not linked to aircraft. On this one, uh, I'm on the lap of my grandfather. That's my uncle, and that's me playing with the F-111, the widow maker of the US Navy. I also came up to work in the industry. Well, Alex said it all, but I'm one of the founders of uh, Zoo, which was back then, we didn't have a name, so we chose to market the airline uh, as Você Escolha, which means you choose. And Professor João was one of the recipients of a lifetime travel pass privilege, so he can fly for the rest of his life on a zoo. And he should fly more often, I guess. <laughs> And Breeze was another uh, thing that I did together with David. I created the name Delivery, and it's a very uh, interesting story. We don't have the time to tell it, but it was very dramatic. Uh, we had the brand created, and within two days, they said, no, we don't like the brand. We need a new brand for the next 48 hours. So that brand was created in 48 hours. Uh, it was truly challenging. So those are a few other uh, liveries that I created or corporate identities. The one that I created when I was um, 11 years old is the first 7 to 7 on the top left. And the others are more current work for different airlines in three continents. I also wrote those books, 18 aviation books. There's one in the pipeline. They are all about commercial aviation. Uh, one of them talks about accidents, of course, the black box and the others chronicle the histories of airlines or model types. Some are written in Portuguese and English, but the vast majority are only available in Portuguese. And currently, I'm the publisher of the Flop uh, International magazine, which, is, which has a fabulous story of 60 years. I started reading this magazine when I was seven. I started writing for it when I was 24, and to cut the long story short, I inherited the magazine two years ago. And it's been my major occupation since then. It's truly challenging to be doing a printed magazine these days. I see that just like working in the vinyl industry. I mean, some people would buy, but not too much. But we're able to make the ends meet, and, and I'm very happy with the, uh, with the results. As Alex mentioned, I travel extensively. It's kind of a, uh, a maniac, uh, uh, 
taking on it. I try to fly as many airlines and get to know as many countries as possible. That's my visually talking, that's my logbook. And I'm going to add another two airlines and two countries in five days. So I'm very happy with that. And finally, and most importantly, my son is a former Eagle. So I had the pleasure of having Thomas um, shooting here. Uh, his, planes, his, his plans were cut short by the pandemic. I couldn't afford the tuition because I lost all my income when the uh, pandemic hit as a consultant. <laughs> I lost my six contracts in the span of two weeks, so I couldn't afford it. Uh, uh, to pay for the tuition. And Mr. Butler didn't give me a cent of discount, so I, I couldn't do anything better than that. But anyway, uh, let's, let's go for the, uh, those 10 hints that talk about the name of this game, which is to survive. This is, uh, I'm talking about the airline world by, by first and foremost. We're, we're gonna be concentrating on the airline world, not aviation in general, not light aviation, not business aviation, but try to consider that this was written with the airline world environment in mind. It is a relentless, it is a very difficult uh, job, it is a very difficult world to be in. As Robert Crandall, the famous um, president and chairman of American Airlines once said, this is a rotten business. And that is no exaggeration. It's a cutthroat business. I mean, there, there's no point for second place. Absolutely. All over the world. So if you see a competitor, try to kill it. We're going to see that. So, 10 hints. The first one, safety first. You've got to consider that no matter what you do, safety must come first. And there is no compromising. There is absolutely... That is sacred. I mean, you can't compromise. You need to think about safety throughout the day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Safety is paramount. There's no business, no commendable business without safety. There's absolutely no way that you can compromise that. And we're still losing customers, passengers, crew members, innocent people on the ground because safety is compromised in many parts of the world. Be it on the airline business, on the light aviation, general aviation business, or military, safety keeps being compromised. The, the lessons are there. We should have learned them better. And uh, that is non-negotiable. Safety comes before anything. So bear that in mind. I mean, no matter what you do, what is your position, try to think about safety night and day. That's the only way to do The second one, I think it's truly important. When people ask me on which industry I am, I say I am in the service industry. Not transportation, not aviation. Not airplanes, not airlines. I'm in the service industry. With the, the fact that we are serving customers that choose to fly on airplanes. But this is very important because I think that when we understand that we're all servants, everything starts to make sense. See, airplanes and airlines, they're commodities. They're flying commodities with marginal margins of of, of uh, financial return. What really makes a, different, uh, a, a difference between flying airline A to airline B is the people that man, crew, maintain, sell those airplanes. So if we don't understand that we are here to serve our customers, we don't get the whole picture. So I always stick to that point because I really think it's absolutely important to consider ourselves as, as servants, because it make, at the end of the day, it makes all the difference. If we think that we are too important because we are a pilot, an ATC controller, a maintenance guy, and that we're doing a favor to be transporting people from A to B, we're totally wrong on that. We are there to serve them. And I love the motto of British Airways. They got it right. They are there to fly and to serve. The third point, which I think is absolutely paramount. Since we are servants, we are serving people. So let's put people first. That's absolutely important. And especially in this country where the airline business is, I don't want to use that word, let me be more political. Where the airline world is, has a, a great participation of the unions, 
I mean, what's the point of having, of having a union in any industry? Can't you negotiate with your employees? Can't you reach a deal? I mean, and, and the history of this industry and many other industries in this country is that they need a union to kind of work as a speed break between two clashing worlds of visions. And if you have the right culture, and I love the phrase from Sir Richard Branson, I mean, you get, you get it right. Treat people decently. Treat them well enough so they can leave, right? But they don't want to. So uh, it's truly important. I mean, you got to learn to be a servant leader. Servant leaders will extract the best that the people have to offer. Don't be a tyrant. Don't, don't think you know everything. Don't think you can overrule other, other people's ideas and decisions. Try to listen from your, from your colleagues, no matter if they're above, under, or on your side. I mean, just open your ears, be humble, be a servant leader, and things will start coming your way. It's not that difficult once you realize that we are also serving the people that work for us. Four, create a sexy brand. That comes without saying. Branding is important. I mean, uh, and brand, it's not only the visual aspects, it's not only the design. I mean, you look at this plane and say, wow, it's a blue plane. I get it, but I mean, uh, there's more to it. And the brand is built by people, for the people. So all the aspects, all the elements that come with training, all, all the things that you say on communication, on the way that you move, on the way that the airplanes are painted, the menus are served, or, or, or how do you deal with cues on, a, on an airport, Every aspect impacts the brand, either positively or negatively. So you've got to take care of that because the brand is built or destroyed as we take off every day. Every flight is a chance either to ruin it or to build a stronger brand. And everything is done by people to other people. So that's why people should come first. Even when it comes to uh, absolutely uh, visual cues, or, I mean, why we painted this aircraft blue? Because David Nineman said, I want the blue airplane, and he got one. But it was his vision, it's his lucky color. And it was important to keep that tradition because he has already carved a, a gigantic name for himself in this industry. So the breeze is kind of his trademark. So it wasn't that difficult to create this brand. But again, you gotta create a sexy brand. You gotta create a sexy brand for a bank, for a funeral home, for an educational institute, for a gas station, it doesn't matter. The brand must be sexy. And when I use sexy, I mean the brand must be desired. And there's another important aspect which I love to, to think about. Uh, there are many ways to showcase your brand, even the ones that you can't see. Like the way that you enter a place, a hotel or an airplane, the way the airplane smells talks a lot about the brand. So you don't want to fly on a smelly airplane. So, I mean, airlines have started to pay attention to that. Private aviation does. So when you went to a private jet, it always smells good because somehow that is impacting your perception of the brand, of the whole experience. So no small detail can be overlooked when we're talking about the brand. That's truly important. The fifth aspect. Communication is key, right? It comes without saying. We are in, in, a, in an industry where communicating is paramount for our own survival. If we don't communicate right, either be on a flight or on a board room, chances are you're going to crash. Crash as an executive, crash as a pilot, crash as a flight attendant, crash as an uh, aviation employee. And I like to think about three letters, which, of course, is a play. Credibility, visibility, and relevance. All your communications must adhere to those three magic words. Your communication must be credible, it must be visible to the people you want to reach, and it must be relevant. I mean, relevance is always something that's overlooked. People, while the brand has credibility, it is seen, but it's totally irrelevant. And balancing those three words is not as easy as one may imagine. So I think that really communication is something that really 
Disruptive companies do that extremely well. I'll give you an example. Um, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but uh, I don't know if I've been to London. Have you seen the gigantic uh, Ferris wheel, the London Eye? Okay, British Airways started to finance that, that project. So for some technical engineering problem, the cranes that were lifting the structure were having a hard time. But the Ferris wheel, the London Eye, already had the British Airways logo. And then Sir Richard Branson has one of his blimps flying over the Ferris wheel with the following message written all over the side of the blimp. BA can get it up. So he sees the opportunity. He's He's disruptive, he's truly a, a maverick in this world. But he took the opportunity to inflict damage on, on a serious competitor. They had before inflicted a lot of damage in Virgin Atlantic. Talking about competition, bless them, because good competition makes you stronger, makes you sharper, makes you wake up early in the morning. But then once you bless it and you learn from it, you got to do whatever is at your disposal to kill your competitor. Bluntly said, you got to kill it. Because actually there's no space for too many airlines, too many flights, too many seats on any given route. So if you don't fly that route, if you don't offer the seats, your competitor will be doing that. And that's not funny. Well, speaking of that in the US, it's really something that you have seen that movie very, very often. I mean, over 200 airlines were created after the, the regulation in 78 and folded in a span of 50 years. So the mortality rate is big because there's incompetence, there's a lot of competition, and there's a lot of guys out there trying to kill you. And that's the name of the game. So survival in the airline industry is a key word. Uh, it's even more important than, for instance, thriving. Thriving is not for everyone, but survival should be the lesson number one. And I love uh, that concept that David Neeleman always says to me, build a better mousetrap. He always said to me, Panda, build a better mousetrap. And he's doing that with Breeze here. Breeze is a mousetrap airline. He has created a model that totally avoids direct competition with the giants like American, Delta, United, Southwest. So Breeze is doing one heck of a job because he understood that it was necessary to create, and he is doing it, creating a better mousetrap. Seven, cut costs at all costs. I don't like this particular issue because I'm a marketing guy. A marketing guy is normally like to spend. It's part of the nature of what we do. But I learned with my good friend, John Rogerson, that Costs are like grass. You got to cut them as they grow, and they grow every single day and night. So be watchful for the costs. Every company needs a Darth Vader, a guy, an Edward Sisters hand that will cut costs, and that includes jobs, expenditure, whatever. I remember when I was designing the international service of a zoo, I wanted to serve a hot breakfast for our customers. And he said, no way, I mean, no. No hot breakfast. I mean, we're not freaking American Airlines. No, 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 cut that. And it was after a lot of negotiation that I was able to put a warm sandwich in an otherwise cold breakfast because Brazilians like hot breakfast by far and large. And I love that phrase. The phrase is, for me is fundamental. If the Wright brothers were alive today, Wilbur would have to fire Oroville to reduce costs. That's absolutely incredible. And that comes from probably one of the three most incredible figures in this industry, Herb Kelleher, the founder of Southwest Airlines. David Neeleman learned a lot from this gentleman and he made a lot of difference on every business that Neeleman created and it still makes a lot of difference to this day. This is true for most industries these days, but the only constant is change this industry will change around the clock. So there is no questioning, no way to stick to adhere to something that is today 
there because that is going to change tomorrow. Technology patterns, consumer uh, impressions, everything is going to change and change rapidly and dramatically in a pace that we have never seen before. So the question is, you got to adapt yourself to an ever-changing environment and don't frown. Don't, don't think that, oh, I just learned that. Now I need to redo it again. Yes, sir. I mean, what you learned yesterday, it doesn't apply today. Technology is doing that. Competition is doing that. The um, environment that airlines operate is also doing that. Who could have predicted the COVID crisis? So airlines had to adapt to survive, and it was overnight with no warning, no chance of understanding and reacting other than with sheer brutality, shoving people out of the windows and doors and, and getting rid of your workforce and grounding airplanes. Constant change, and there's gonna be more. I mean, we can be sure this industry will keep changing. Aim high, excellence is not a destination, it's a state of mind. If you're happy where you are, that doesn't count. You've got to strive to be excellent on everything you do, from the eggs that you fry in breakfast to the way that you talk to other people, listen to a record. I mean, you've got to search for excellence. Aiming high is the only way to steal the show, to go places where your competitors aren't going. So being excellent in what you do, be it an airline, or any other form of human activity is the only way to stand out. Searching for excellence is absolutely, absolutely pivotal, fundamental. And I love this phrase. The higher we soar, the smaller we appear to those who cannot fly. You probably have, have run into this kind of feeling before. They don't get what I'm doing or trying to do because they're sitting on the ground and they're trying to go from 38,000 feet to 60,000 feet to 100,000 feet. So aim high in everything you do. I mean it, aim high. This is a country that has aimed high for the past century. And look where we are. Look what you as a society have accomplished. It's the best, I would say this word, it's the best country in the world, right? By a, by a sizable margin. That's why I moved with my family here seven years ago, because I said, I want my kids to grow up in America and I hope I'll become an American citizen within a year. Because I truly identify myself with the values of the society, because you'll never, you'll never, you'll never applaud the second place. Let things do, it's a different story. But America, man, you always look up for number one. And that what really brought you as a nation, as the American people, where you are. Finally, never stop flying. Never stop investigating. Never stop going places. That's North Korea, by the way, and I've been there, and it was amazing. An incredible story. I flew on this airplane. Uh, I flew different, seven different types in North Korea. That was incredible. Incredible journey. Incredible story. But never stop flying. Never stop investigating. Never stop going places. Never stop trying to see what's beyond the horizon. That's what's going to make you and the company that you work for differentiate yourselves and create something that hasn't been created yet. See the world. It's more fantastic than any dream. As the novelist Ray Bradbury said, with absolutely spot on. And that's the only picture that wasn't taken by me. It was taken by a former Eagle, Thomas Betting, and I want to say thank you for bearing with me. Thank you so very much. Running a little late, I guess. Yeah. So we'll fall on to the um, Q and A part, the fun part. Um, we'll have some fun on the way because I have some questions from you that, um, and we're going to open up on the last fifteen minutes or so for you guys to come over and have any theme or question for Mr. Betting. But I wanted to start with a question that probably most of the people that are in this room are wondering: Why Panda? Well, when I started in advertising, I, I always liked to eat. I'm 
too short for my weight, actually. <laughs> so uh, I always like to eat, and when I come every day from, from lunch, I would greet everybody and say, hi, people. And my boss would look up and say, see, the new hire is always happy when he returns <laughs> from lunch. Always happy, happy like a panda. And on the very next day, he's stuck. So I became panda. And you embrace that nickname, I guess. Oh, yeah, I have a horrible name. Gianfranco is a name that can be pronounced anywhere, <laughs> except Italy, so Panda is short. I guess it's, it's your trademark right now. I, I yeah, it. I guess so. All right, awesome. Um, you spoke during the presentation that um, there's been some, I could say, conflict on the creation of the Breeze Airways brand, that you guys had to come up with a new brand within 48 hours. How, how did that happen? How that unfolded? Well, as every other organization, when I presented the, I did a hundred different designs until David was satisfied. So we fixed the design and Airbus wanted the designs by December 15. So I gave the final uh, drawings for them on December 21, already a week late. And then on January the 3rd, a person from the board called me and said, Panda, guess what? We're back to square one. Uh, David changed his mind that we want a total different brand. So it was very difficult to create a brand because time was, was already not on our side. I had no time to create it. And then I started scratching the Breeze name and then I realized that it's an easy in the middle of it and the rest is history. But it took me two days to create the brand as, as it is today. Awesome. And you founded the airline with David Newman back in 2019. And well, a year later, we know what happened. And how was she, you know, go through a newborn airline throughout that difficult moment of COVID-19 during 2020? Wow, it was horrendous because nobody could predict what was coming and severity of it. So, uh, I mean, I was back then, I was a consultant for seven, six different companies, five in aviation, one uh, in the transport business. And I lost a six contracts overnight. I mean, in a spat of two weeks. I mean, they said, well, we're get letting you go because we don't we can't afford consultants because they were shoving firing like thousands of employees so truly challenging and uh well but the government in the u.s gave a package of support for the airlines very different from my native brazil where they didn't get a penny so they are in true dire straits as we speak uh, and since we talked about COVID 19 would you say that that was the hardest time at your career or would you have another time that you had a, like a really big challenge and you did something to overcome it? No, I had challenges just like everybody else. I mean, nothing is totally favorable to you, but COVID was just uh, unbearable. It was like nobody was prepared. It, it was probably the biggest economic crisis of all time, bigger than the 29 crash bigger than the Second World War, because at, at those events, parts of the world were spared. Not now. I mean, the whole world suffered. And the airlines and, and the hospitality industry in particular, they took a, a direct hit. So it was horrendous. I mean, I saw people committing suicide. I have a friend that's a former airline pilot. Now he drives an Uber. And it, it's been disastrous for his uh, mental state i mean used to be an airbus captain now he drives an uber and poor poor gentleman he's 62 too late to return to the business and he said my life is over i was born to fly i had a 40-year career I'm driving an uber to pay to try to pay the bills so nothing compared to the uh, covid crisis it was the most difficult moment i think it's a more a volatile industry and you know those things um, happened, but you know, as you said, the good part was that you know the U.S. government um, gave some assistance to the airlines here. It wasn't the case with the Brazilian ones, as you mentioned. Uh, what would you say there were the aspects that made the Brazilian airlines survive since you had uh, experience founding Azul, for example? What made it thrive throughout that time? Well, the bank rolled most of the debt, so they're still breathing, but they're on intensive care financially speaking. Uh, by far and large, I think that the, uh, the road ahead is going to be bumpy, to say the least, because they have those huge, un unsurmountable debts that eventually will have to be paid or else. So 
it's tough. I mean, it's far from over. Absolutely far from over. And throughout the world, the amount of aid that was given by the governments to the airlines varied dramatically. So richer countries footed the bills in many cases, but in a poor country, not a poor country, but in a, in a challenged country just like Brazil is, the government just crossed their arms and said, fend off for yourselves. And that was the case. So the three airlines there are still bleeding from the economic standpoint. And some analysts are predicting that maybe one won't make it. So it's just that difficult. Yeah, it's already a very difficult environment. And you had experience to um, found those two airlines with David Newman, who founded not only two, but five airlines. So he founded uh, Morris Air, WestJet, JetBlue, Azul, and now Breeze Airways, the last two with you. Um, and there's always that phrase that comes into my mind when I talk about David, that um, if you want to be a millionaire founding an airline, it's easy. The first step is to be a billionaire. Um, how would you say, how, how, what's your stance on, on that phrase and how you and David like overcome and you know, prove the contrary on that phrase? Well, every rule has one or, or a few exceptions and David doesn't apply to that. He is probably one of the only guys in the world that consistently made money out of this very tough business because he knows how to build a better mousetrap. He, this guy is absolutely incredible. He, uh, when, when you spend an afternoon with him, you go back to your house, lay your head on the pillow and say, my goodness, is that right? I mean, how come? He's totally brilliant. He's a piece of work, I mean, very unique person. But he understood the, the, his principles and he followed his recipe. He treats his employees very well. In turn, they treat their customers brilliantly and the customers return to fly on his airlines, thus filling his pockets and the pockets of the other investors. So it's a beautiful circle that starts spinning so he made money in all of those airlines. So, and for instance, Alitalia never made a penny. The airline of Italy, they never turned a profit. Southwest Airlines, pre-pandemic, they only had three quarters of negative results. Everything else was, was making some serious dough. So there are exceptions, but all those exceptions come from airlines and founders and visionaries that create something that is not out there. Recipe for disaster, enter any market and try to offer what the established competitors are already offering. If you do that, 100% guarantee you're gonna fail miserably. So if you enter as a challenger, and that's the case of Breeze, that was the case of Azul, you gotta try. You gotta do something absolutely different. Otherwise, the competitors are gonna learn, jump on top of you, and kill you. It's all about the killing that I was talking at the other moment. He was always smart, shrewd enough to avoid direct hits from the competitors. Be it American Airlines, United, Southwest, or in Brazil, Latam and Gold. Truly amazing guy. And speaking of of, of, of David Newman, um, he. He actually, you know, um, had to get out of JetBlue, and that's what I guess sparked his interest for founding a new airline in Brazil, and that's where he found you. Uh, we know it's already a hard and volatile environment. I would say it's even harder coming from Brazil to found a new airline there. But you know, Newman and you succeeded, and you know, um, brought up a whole new airline. You know, do you want to expand a little bit about that story? Yeah, I remember that once he went to talk to a very top-notch government official in Brazil. And the first thing the person did was ask for $6 million in her pocket. And he came back from Brazil, because before he went to Brazil, he said, Panda, I'm going to meet this lady tomorrow, very top-notch government official. And he asked me, is she clean? I said, no, she's not. Oh, come on. For you, everybody's dirty. I said, <laughs> well, go there, check, and when you come back, just call me. And he got back the very next day, summoned me to his office, closed the door, and said, you were right. And within five minutes of conversation, she was asking me to 
pay six million dollars in her bank account. And it was our first meeting. I just had met her. How, how come you Brazilians understand that? The answer was, we don't. I mean, it's, I mean, from the moral standpoint, this country is in the medieval ages, especially with that party in power. So, he, and more than once, he came to me and said, Peta, I, I don't believe how you guys tolerate that. I mean, it's absolutely impossible to do business in this country. He said, it's not impossible. It's just more difficult. We're making it. We're making it being absolutely clean and without bribing anyone. It's going to take longer, but we're going to succeed. And we are establishing a new uh, ground in terms of governance, of how authorities must be treated. And I'm very proud of it because we never gave a penny to any airline official in the country. So it's possible. It will only be bumpier and will take longer to reach your destination. And it's not only possible, but um, you guys succeeded. And since you brought that up, um, tomorrow is a very special day, not here only in America, not only in Brazil, but in the whole world, because tomorrow is um, Women, International Women's Day. And Embryo always fostered the inclusion of women in an industry that was pretty well known to be male dominant in the past few years, in the past, since its incipients, I would say. And you and David did a really nice initiative in Brazil with Azul regarding that, where you uh, basically took the initiative of um, the lack of inclusion with also the breast cancer awareness. You want to expand a little bit on that story? Well, yeah, as, as an airplane buff, I had known what uh, American Airlines was doing, Delta was doing, so I was aware of the pink airplanes that they were flying, and I thought, wow, that's brilliant. So on the, one day I'm doing a presentation in the south of Brazil in Porto Alegre, and this lady comes to me after the presentation and say, "Listen, I'm a, uh, I, I take care of patients with breast cancer. I represent the society that I, that I founded, Femama. And is there something that your airline could do to raise the awareness for the breast cancer uh, fight? Every day, 51 women in Brazil died out of breast cancer." Is there something that you could do to raise the awareness of the cause? Then I catch my flight back to my hometown, Sao Paulo, and on the flight I said, wow, it's obvious. The airline is called Azul, which means blue in, in, in Portuguese. Let's paint a, an airplane pink. So then I, I photoshopped one airplane in pink colors, and I presented to the board, and then one gentleman sitting there said, what, a pink airplane, they're gonna call us the gay airline. And I, I couldn't believe my ears. And David looked at this gentleman and said, you're out of your mind. It's brilliant. It's beautiful. Panda, let's do it. And off we did. Uh, we put together Embraer and ATR as co-partners. And the stories are absolutely amazing because we threw a flying circus. This airplane was screwed by a female-only um, cruise. We threw events in 25 different Brazilian cities. We, it became part of the syllabus of working for Azul. Do your own breast examination. I mean, look after the problems before they become big. I mean, it, it became something that, uh, it, it became part of our routine. And it, it is accounted that we have saved at least five different lives by adopting and embracing this cause. And we adopted other causes as well. So I'm very proud of, of that because it, it's well worth it. We saved five lives, so absolutely worth it. If it was only one, I think it would be absolutely. already worth it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you work with lots of companies and you consult a lot of um, aviation and even non-aviation companies. So um, if you could take all of these companies and put one component that they, you say they often overlook and you often have to make them pay attention to something that's always missing. Do you see a trend on that or it's always a different scenario, a different thing that... Treat your people right, foster a great culture, make people proud to be wearing their uniforms, to be representing those companies. I also, I, I'm not a founder, but I, I am a partner of a, of, a, uh, of a food processing company in Brazil. We do rice, beans, and, and uh, maizena, for instance. So 
on two days of a every given week, I go and talk about bre uh, of bread, pasta, beans, and rice. Not anything to do with aviation. But I still think that uh, the same principles apply for that industry as well. And I tell the owner, the founder said, treat your people right. Make them proud to be wearing our colors. I mean, create something that is extraordinary and do a sexy brand. I mean, if so, I mean, when I personally designed the, the packages for rice and beans, and uh, it was so successful that Unilever, the gigant in this industry from England, when they saw it, they said, no, we want that worldwide. Because, I mean, I, I apply the principles of trying to be sexy selling rice and beans, and it's possible to do it. It's by design. It's by investing in the right typeface, in the proper photography. Caring for a brand is like caring for a newborn. Newborn caring is 24-hour dedication. You can't leave a newborn baby by itself for 10 minutes and all hell breaks loose. So your brand should be taken care of with the same amount of dedication, of passion, following every aspect in detail, the social media, what they're saying about you, reacting immediately, um, aspects of branding, uniforms, I mean, I remember I was I designed the livery for Azul, and when we received our first ATR on the big front door of the ATR, the instructions were written. It's a standard position. They were written, and they went on top of Azul of Azul's logo. And I went to Toulouse, and I saw that, and said, "That's not acceptable." I called the meeting with the technical guy. Said, "I can't live with the instructions going over my brand." And the engineers frowned and said, ah, come on, Panda, nobody's going to notice that. I did. I don't want that. I don't want anything on top of my brand. I said, come on, Panda, that's pretty standard. I said, yeah, but I don't want that. Let me, let me give you the solution. Came back to the hotel, photoshopped all the technical texts that goes on the side of the airplane and presented the next day. I said, I want the text written in this way. I'll foot the bill. I said, oh, okay, you're insufferable. Okay, all right. So they did it. So if you look at an Azul airplane, on top of the logo, there's not a single tiny little word on top of the logo. The logo is sacred. The brand is sacred. Would you write something on top of a newborn baby? You wouldn't. So treat the brand as a newborn baby at all times, with all circumstances, because that's what brands deserve. Unrelentless passion, unrelentless attention to detail. There's no other part of my French. There's no. I'll, I'll, I'll hold my horse. <laughs> There's no other way to treat a brand but to treat it with total passion and attention to detail. It makes a difference. That's awesome. Um, you also mentioned about caring for people is the other I mean, most important part on that case. And when we say, when you say people. You say about the customers, but I guess you're also mentioning the people that are within the company. And within that regard, do you agree with the, fa uh, the phrase, the customer is always right? No, I don't. I absolutely do not. I mean, treat your employees better than anyone else and treat them well before you even treat the customers. Because if they are well treated, they become brand ambassadors. They become sellers of the company. They become guys that will thump the chest and say, I work for Breeze, I work for Azul, I work for Tesla. They'll be proud. They will be working towards the success of the company. There's, they're going to start to have the sense of ownership, which is absolutely paramount if you want to make a difference. If you have 10,000 employees in your company, you want to think about them like they're 10,000 Salesmen and saleswomen selling your company, your brand, your product, your services. If they are disgruntled, if they are not treated well, if they are treated uh, in in a improper way, they're they're not going to represent your your brand, your company. So treat them well, and let them treat the customers well. But David is capable of doing both things. I mean, he would uh, walk around the aisles on air, airplanes or at the airports, talking to each customer doing selfies, just talking to them. Just incredible. Very humble guy. That's awesome. Um, in your presentation, you also mentioned um, about the safety aspects and how safety is sacred. 
How would safety and marketing go hand in hand? Uh, is it possible for um, an airline, for example, communicate safety through their marketing? No, you, you don't use the word safety. That's a sacrilege. You talk about maintenance. You talk about training. You don't say we're the safest airline. You can't say that. But you can say we train our pilots properly. We invest gazillions of dollars in maintenance. We have this beautiful compound of training. We invest in simulators. Because it's totally wrong to be saying, we're the safest airline in this part of the world. No, we can't say that. It's totally wrong. So you've got to be very careful. You can talk about <laughs> what you do in order to become a safer operation, but you can't thump on your chest. We're safe. Well, very safe airlines lost airplanes and customers. So there's a lot of elements. So you, you never say that. You say, we work hard. Uh, to do whatever it's at our disposal or within our reach to create a safer transportation company. That's the max you can say. Got it. And speaking of a bit of your background and that passion, not only for aviation but for, for marketing, I always wondered which was, which was the one who come, came first? Was it aviation? Was marketing? Did they come together? Did you always also want to be a pilot? No, I mean, I, I, I'm crazy about aviation since I can remember. And when I was four, my dad asked me, what do you want to have for, as a birthday present? I said, take me to the airport. And that was my gift, actually. He took me to Congoyans downtown airport just to see airplanes taking off and landing. So that came first. I always wanted to be a pilot, but I'm severely limited. I couldn't become a pilot because of my poor eyesight, which, which is something that I, that I inherited from him. And then I, at the very early age, at seven, I knew I couldn't be a commercial pilot back on the rules that were applied back then. So I said, well, I'm going to start drawing airplanes and then taking pictures of airplanes. And that led to my dad saying, well, you got a knack for, for communication, for drawing. Why don't you start either architecture or communication? So that became my profession. Uh, my passion, I, I got three passions in life, aviation, Food, as the name Panda implies, <laughs> and music. Music is really big for me. That's, that's really beautiful. Um, you also mentioned that um, beforehand on our lunch and that you had basically a mentor on your early age. Um, he was the founder of a really well-known Brazilian airline at the time, Trans Brazil, where you drew deliveries for. Um, how was that mentorship? And would you say that he was you know, the most important asset and friend that guided you throughout the aviation career? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, after my father, he's the most important figure in my life. I was nine when I met this gentleman that had founded Trans Brazil Airlines. He was a true pioneer. He founded the airline uh, in 1954. Uh, the year was 74, 20 years, the, the airline was 20 years back then and they were starting to receive Boeing 727s, former brand of aircraft. So that's why the, the airplanes are, were already colorful and I fell in love with the brand, I fell in love with the colors, I fell in love with the airline. And one day we, we started to go to a social club in Brazil and one day my father summons me and when I approach him I see that he's talking to the founder, Captain Fontana. And I go like, gee, that's Captain Fontana. I was nine years old. And he comes to me and said, your father said you like aviation. I said, yes sir. Tell me the names of the three heavy bombers of England during the Second World War. Lancaster, Stirling, and Halifax. Hmm. What's the fleet of Trans Brazil? 12 aircraft, six Dark Harrods, six Back 111s. Hmm. What are the registrations? I give the registration and I go like, oh, all right. So what, what are you going to do after lunch? I, said, I don't know. So he took me to the hangar. We did a thorough visit. And on the end of the visit, he grabbed the four uh, desktop models and gave to me. And that was the beginning of, uh, of a relationship that became as close as it could be, much to the chagrin of his family. I mean, he had four daughters that hated me to the guts because my, my teenage years were like this. I mean, I would meet him in the club on a Sunday and he would go, you have any uh, exams this week? He said, yeah, I got geography on Thursday. No, you don't. We're going to fly to Toulouse because I have a meeting to see the A300 and I want you to be my personal escort and secretary. Yeah, really. So at the tender age of 16, I was already visiting Airbus, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, uh, Farnborough, uh, Le Bourget, 
other venues. And I was always behind him and said, listen well, don't say anything. When we get to the hotel, I'm going to ask you a plethora of questions. So, so I learned firsthand uh, the tricks of the trade from this incredible gentleman. And when he passed away, I felt like I had lost a uh, fatherly figure. And I wrote a book about Trans-Brazil, and it was one of the happiest days in my life when I finally presented the book to his family. It, was, it felt like a circle coming to a nice ending. That's beautiful. Um, speaking of the books you published, you're also an avid spotter, I would say, and for those who don't know what spotter is, basically a, an aviation photographer. Um, you've published over 780,000 pictures, and you have more than 20,000 posts on Instagram, uh, just on part of that, and you also have some displays here on the hall. How did the passion develop, and did you have any crazy stories of you trying to get a good <laughs> angle at a certain airport? Well, the passion came out of the fact that I couldn't fly. So I started drawing, and then I would go to the airport to take pictures of the airplanes. And then I realized back then, I'm talking about seven, 1976, that some people collected the images, took pictures and kind of, oh, I got a picture of Tango Yankee Tango. So I, now I need a picture of Tango Yankee Sierra. So uh, that evolved to, oh, today is more than 800,000 images. It became an image pack. For instance, I was the only guy that photographed the four aircraft involved in September 11. There are lots of pictures of, uh, of those particular four aircraft, but to my knowledge, no other person has photographed the four uh, aircraft involved. And I saw those photographs for Time magazine, which published them on the second edition after September 11, and they paid me the royal sum of $25 <laughs> for the four images. Um, no, it's it's a, it's a incredible passion. So when I realized I couldn't fly, I started taking pictures of airplanes, and I still do. I travel with my camera. So tomorrow, when I get to Orlando Airport, I'm going to be on the lookout to see if there's something moving, or and I do it. It's a, it's compulsive. It's something that I can. Just, and yeah, I mean, I had I had very incredible close calls with the police, with bad guys in many areas of the world. I almost got killed by a policeman in Mexico. I almost got shot at Miami International by a cop that didn't like me taking pictures just after September 11. <clears throat> I was in between an assault car and a hovering uh, Bell Huey from the Carabinieri at Roma Airport. And they were, I was in the middle, stuck in the middle, and they had the machine gun on top, machine gun in front of me. And I said, what's, what's wrong with me? I mean, it's, what's the problem? And then as I left the place, an El Al uh, 767 came taxi. And, ah, I see. I shouldn't be there because there is an El Al aircraft taxi by. So, yeah, very, very incredible stories um, that happened throughout uh, over almost 40 years of airplane spotting. Most of them are beautiful stories of meeting incredible people. I remember I was in Mexico on that fateful week, and a, a very humble man came to me and looked at me, and I looked at him. And after two minutes, we started chatting. And he started, I speak some Spanish, and then we started communicating. I said, what you doing? He said, taking pictures of airplanes. Why? Well, because I love them. Why? Wow, they're beautiful. They take you places. And so then we start chatting, and then he disappears and returns with an apple. Uh, I mean, uh, more than, than poor, a very um, a miserable human being. I mean, the guy that the guy was in shambles. He comes and offers the apple. And I go like, thank you, sir. I, uh, no, I'm not hungry. No, 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 no. Listen, you've been so kind to me. Nobody talks to me. And you were one of the first that talked to me. And the only thing that I can give you is this apple. Please accept. It's the only thing that I can give to you to retribute what the way, the nice way that you treated me. And that brings us back to the very beginning. Treat people well. It's a recipe for a long, incredible journey because when you're arrogant, when you treat people in ways that they don't deserve to be treated, eventually that will come back to you. That's awesome. Um, it's a really nice lesson. And speaking of which, uh, we have a really diverse public here with lots of majors, you know, business, um, aerospace engineering, aeronautical science. If you could give 
one or two advices for the folks that are here that are from <coughs> freshmen to seniors? What would be that one advice or two advices? Never stop learning. Read everything that you can. Uh, read every kind of magazine, newspaper. It doesn't have to be technical information. R expand your horizons. Start to learn about politics, geopolitics, uh, biology, geography. Expand your horizons. I mean, knowledge is like bricks. If you really want to build a fortress, you're going to need a lot of bricks. And those bricks come from all walks of life, all fields of knowledge. Uh, so never, never stop learning. So when the other guys go to the beach or pop up a beer, just open a book, read a book, read a magazine, go on online and check the latest news, learn what the classics have to teach you, learn from the greats, and get rid of this trash. <laughs> you spend too much time with this <laughs> if you're part of my French. Put that aside. Communicate and that's it. But read books and magazines and read information that is not here because here there's only girls dancing and no, get rid of that. Ten, minute, ten minutes max. And my kids, I'm a total failure. I'm talking about it. My kids, I wrote 18 books about aviation. They have read one. And I come to them and said, Tom, for Christ's sake. You want to be a pilot? I wrote 17 books about aviation. You don't have the nerve to have, to have read two. You just <laughs> read one and black box because he loves accidents. Said, yeah, they're books. I said, what's wrong with that? Come on, books, paper? Nah. So it's horrendous. I, f I felt like I crumbled because... I hate that. I mean, I hate living in a world where people spend a lot of time in this machine of created by the devil himself, than to start to learn or listen to good music and educate yourself in other fields. So I'm an engineer. Go learn about music. Go learn about something that has nothing to do with the things that you do on your daily basis. Because out of music theory, out there, there might be something that's going to make a lot of difference in your engineering career, be it harmonics, be it... So try to cross different areas of knowledge and never, never stop learning. Oh, you're a nerd? A die time, a, a, a die hard nerd. I, w I have always been. People would go to the beach, I would go to the books. I'm happy as a king. So never stop learning, never stop learning. That's rule number one. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions still left for um, Mr. Batting, but uh, what I'm going to suggest now is that if any of you have any questions or themes you want to consider, we have two microphones on one on each aisle. You're more than welcome to come down. Uh, we'll intercalate between both. I'm going to ask one more question, and the microphone is free for um, whatever you guys want to ask him um, about the themes that we spoke of today or even a new thing that you guys want to ask him for. So the mics are free. And um, I just have one question before that, because you mentioned uh, about your kids. You have two sons, and one I had the pleasure to um, know him and be my friend. How's that thing of a uh, father passing on his passion for his sons? Do you have high expectations? Sometimes uh, do you get in arguments of not following the paths that you uh, would like him or to follow? I try to use the same rule that my father used to me. He said, I don't care what you're going to be or you want to be. Just do it properly. If you want to be a ice cream maker, do the best ice cream in the world. If you want to do a paint, if you want to be a painter, just paint great pictures. If you want to be a musician, compose a symphony. If you want to be a pilot, do proper landings. Um, and I use I use that to my kids. Tom is already bitten by the the aviation bug. Of course, that makes me proud and happy. Uh, <laughs> I was on the on the checkout line at Publix in Miami. So one of his colleagues filmed Tom landing the Cessna 172 at Embry-Riddle, his first landing. And I opened the video and I realized what it was. And as the Cessna touched the ground, I couldn't hold my tears. I mean, it was like a dream coming true for me. He gave me the wings that I couldn't get. 
And I thank you guys at Embry-Riedel for that. I will be always thankful for that. Thank you. Thank, thanks for sharing that. And if um, following up on that, see if you have the chance on the future, maybe a new technology that could enable you to get uh, a medical one fly, would you do it? I'm too old for that. <laughs> I would much rather stay on the ground taking pictures of, of my son flying, his colleagues. I'm too old for that. That's how I feel. I, mean, I would love to. And one of the best days in my life when, was when I completed a simulator ride on a 737. Uh, the landing was kind of a aggression to the planet, but okay. here we are. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Um, speaking of the present, um, you're currently now on Flap International, which um, is basically a, a magazine in Brazil all about aviation and has decades of archives. Um, you were friends with, I think, the founder, Mr. Spaghet, um, who uh, passed away a few years ago. Um, did you embark an endeavor from um, an insider there that invited you to take over, or it was something that was always in your plans to um, have a job on that? Now, Flap Magazine is now 60 years of constant publications, the oldest magazine in Brazil, 60 years, six decades. And uh, I started reading the magazine when I was seven. And I became friends with Spagat when I was 20 and started writing and photographing for the magazine when I was 24. So I was a regular contributor. Um, 10 years ago, he comes, he comes to me and says, listen, I'm opening a um, foundation because he didn't have any kids. So he said, when I'm gone, nobody's going to take care of that. So I want you to be the president. Would you accept it? I said, yeah. I don't want to talk about it, but I will. Okay, so I'm going to set up a foundation and when I go, you're going to take care of the foundation. Okay, he passes away on December 21st, 2021. And I, I felt really terrible because we were really, really close friends. Absolutely close friends. And on January, his lawyer calls me and say, well, he donated everything, that, every cultural as aspect of the magazine for you, but the business. He wants the magazine to be shut down. But you're going to inherit the 2.2 million images, the biggest collection of uh, airline menus in the world, uh, an incredible collection of over 1,000 models, including uh, one signed by Alexander Calder himself, the beautiful big DC-8 of Braniff International, the flying colors. And I said, well, I knew what it represented. So I live, back then I live in, in a comfortable house. I built five different rooms to accommodate everything. And I said, I'm not going to let the magazine die. I'm going to fight for it. And here we are. Uh, after eight months and eight editions, the magazine is going well, f soaring to new heights, um, with proper recognition from, from the media. For instance, we, after he passed away, we lost uh, the account of Gulfstream. What did I do? Hop on a plane, go to Savannah, and knock on their door. I said, why? We've been partners for, for decades. Wow, well, you know, Mr. Spagat passed away and uh, we don't think the magazine is going to make it. I said, I'm here. How many times Flap came to Savannah to visit you over 40 years of partnership? Not once. I said, see, it's different. So bring the, the, the ads back. So I'm very proud to say that we have, on average, over 30 pages of advertising per issue, which is more than double what the two biggest magazines, aviation magazines in the world have. It's, it's all about working 16 hours a day and never giving up. Oh, Gulfstream doesn't want to do it? Let's go to freaking Savannah. Let's knock on their door. I said, no, you need to advertise. Oh, the show want to cut that down. Go to freaking Toulouse and talk to them. We'll never give up. Never give up. It's not easy, but never give up. And I love that the, for, edition, for this month's edition, um, you guys are doing uh, one related to you. Um, Women aviators yeah. and women in aviation as well. If you would like to expand on that and how the initiative brought us. Yeah, I thought it was a, a well-deserved tribute. So we're, we're calling it the pink issue because it's fully dedicated to women in aviation. From A to Z, we're interviewing only women. They're chronicling the pioneers, the, the current uh, leaders in this industry, both abroad and in Brazil, that have something to say. And there's gladly hundreds and thousands of women in the military, business aviation, presidents, CMOs, CFOs, 
and we're in interviewing, showcasing them. And on the cover, I did a beautiful, I know, no modesty here. I did a beautiful shot of a, of a lady that looks gorgeous. She's wearing a World War II leather helmet, the goggles, and this pink uh, scarf. And it looks like a, an old image. You mentioned she was an Azul captain, and it reminded me of um, uh, a really funny story that you went through with David Newman at the time that you were um, painting the aircraft for Azul. Um, I guess you guys went with like a, an argument with Airbus because you, want, you had the Azul logo, which is a representation of all Brazilian states and each one with a different color. And at the time, Airbus charged the painting per color. So how, how that story unfolded and how did you guys get to you know, do a, a sustainable logo for the company that was just getting born? Well, I created the logo and I said, Brazil has 25, 27 states. And I want each state to have a different color to represent the differences between the states, right? And people said, that's nonsense, man. We should have like six colors and we'll, we'll tell the same story. I said, yeah, but there's a significance behind it. So, okay, we go to 27 colors. So people at Embraer, they have to paint each and every square on a different color. They constantly remember my mom when, whenever they're painting the tail of an Azure aircraft. And Airbus said, fine, we charge by the color. So uh, that's a $10,000 per color figure out. I said, no, come on, no way. And at the end of the day, uh, whenever you see an Airbus flying uh, with the zoo colors, the map is, um, is uh, an adhesive, it's just a sticker. It's not the same result, but it was the only way to circumnavigate because it, uh, Airbus was adamant, said one color. Actually, no, it's not $10,000, $100,000 per color. So, Lufthansa has two colors, so they charge 200,000. Alitalia has four, they charge 400,000, not Alitalia, Ita. So they charge by the color, no questions, no. So it's a, it's a sticker now. The airlines that have the um, Euro white livery that you, you're not a big fan of, they are the ones who, I guess, benefit from that because they don't have to pay much, I guess. Well. Then again, you can always do a pizza with less ingredients to the point that nobody will want to eat it. So you got to add some, some tomatoes, some juice, some olives, some capers, and you keep adding it until it's flavorful. The brands are the same. Brands need to be colorful with a lot of distinction, with a lot of personality. Otherwise, you go just go play that stupid Aero White trash. And the Aero Lingus, the new livery, is to, <laughs> to draw up. Yeah. And I spoke with a guy that created, said, well, I know the old green one was, had a lot more personality, but you know, the guys from finance, they wanted us just to do a wide fuselage and green on the tail. So, there we go. The world is being run by bean counters. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice that you found a way to circumnavigate that and still put your creative work into a zoo. That's, that's really nice. Wasn't easy. <laughs> I guess we have some, some questions for you. I'm going to start with here on the, on the right, and then we'll go between both, please. So uh, this actually plays pretty well, what you guys were saying, into my questions, because I had two quick little questions about liveries. So um, first off, the tribute to Ayrton Senna from Azul. Who, was that you behind that? Yeah. That, that's fantastic. I really appreciated that. And then, um, io sono italiano. So <laughs> hearing you talk about Alitalia and Ita was pretty funny to me. But um, what do you think of Ita's new livery? Because it's got those very small little details near the tail section. So that's pretty hard to orchestrate. It's a bit complex. Well, it is complex. But then again, the new brands need to be unisex. They need to be sexy for both men and women. Before, it was just for the men. This is the men's industry, so look sharp, a nigo, a flying thing, a narrow. Now they create a delivery that looks like a haute couture, a, a Armani purse with the little icons, yeah, the because little. that's a staple of Italian culture. So I applaud the branding for that, but I personally don't like it, but I understand it makes the brand sexier for women. I love, the, I love Italy, that's my family, I'm Gianfranco, so that's yeah. my cultural upbringing is mostly Italian. Uh, 
so I think that the brands need they need to talk more to a broader range of people. So I think they did a terrific job on that one. Thank you. Really like. And and the Ayrton Senna is a true a funny story. The marketing manager of Ayrton Senna comes to me and says, well, within 25 days, we're going to be celebrating 20 years of the passing of Ayrton Senna, which was a very uh, chronical, famous Brazilian Formula One driver. Is there something you can do to pay some tribute to, to Senna? And then I put the helmet on, on the nose of the aircraft. So the aircraft flew, flew with this big Ayrton Senna helmet and we got it painted in record time because everybody said this is impossible. I said, no, it's not. Do you have the paint? No, I have to order, but we're going to paint this aircraft. I'm going to do it. I'm a big Senna fan. Can you do it? No, I can't. We need five weeks. No, look at the plane. Oh, is that the plane? I said, I'm going to do it. So I, I kept uh, burning down the, the barriers because it's the only way to do it. Don't take no for, for, for an answer. Just Thank you. Um, that's I have a oh, I have a question about um, the pricing system. So obviously, with Breeze, you have nice, nicer, and nicest. Was it your idea to come up with that pricing tier name, and uh, was it just coincidence that they're also sixty nine dollars? <laughs> Don't put me in this tight position. <laughs> uh, interesting position, maybe. No, um, no. I mean, the prices are always changing. And I didn't participate on the commercial aspects of the Breeze branding, of the Breeze business. It was a total different group. Uh, my participation with Breeze was pretty much uh, the branding and the cultural aspects. I mean, I designed some of the principles and values. For instance, when we first coined the five principal values, David was satisfied. And then I, I touched David and said, we're forgetting excellence. We gotta be excellent. You're damn right. Let's include the excellence as a as a core value for the company. So I, I took care of branding and uh, service and culture aspects. That was my contribution. Um, commercial aspects I had already left the company. When when because I mean the company was ready to start. Then pandemic hit, and then I was back in Brazil trying to find a job, and then they started without me, and I didn't. I said I'm not. Not gonna live in Salt Lake City, no way, sir. So I can I can elaborate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we're gonna take uh, one more here. Um, the other one, we're more than welcome to come over and speak later because we're running out of time. So we're gonna do yeah. one more question yeah. before we. Uh, so uh, I love hearing you talk about like the the whole map you did with like all the flights you did and all the airlines you tried. And I want to know like what's the most unique. Uh, probably interesting airline and airport that you've experienced? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, flying the Concorde was something very unique. Flying North Korea, the Air Corio airline was absolutely unforgettable. Flying all those old crappy Russian types, Ilyushin 1862, 76, <laughs> Tupolevs, Antonovs, it was mesmerizing. Um, and in terms of high quality, I would probably say the Singapore, I rank Singapore as the best airline consistently best, but the best flight I ever had in my life, there were two. Um, once I flew in the cockpit of a Lockheed Electra, my favorite airliner in Alaska, and I did the whole trip in the cockpit. I, actually, the story is funny. I left my native Brazil, showed up at Anchorage Airport, and I did but talking about 1997 and then I approached the counter and said hi uh, do you have any flights today I said yeah we're going to Dillingham with the Electra yeah okay I want a ticket okay when are you returning well today you're going to Dillingham today and returning today I said yeah why are you doing that because I just came here to Alaska to fly the Electra hey hold really I said yeah hold a minute and she disappeared and I go like oh boy I just said something stupid. And then this old lady shows up. Yes, ma'am, I just came all the way from Brazil to fly the Lockheed Electra, my favorite airliner. She looks at the, the young worker says, I like this guy, he's my kind of guy. So give him the ticket and uh, you came all the way from Brazil to fly the Electra? I said, yes, ma'am, you're, you're gonna be our guest. You wanna fly in the cockpit? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna fly in the cockpit. 
And by the way, here's my, my business card, Janice Reeve Ogle, the daughter of Richard Reeve, the founder of Reeve Aleutian Airlines. Doesn't get any better than that. Captain Tollinson, we did Anchorage, Dillingham, Dillingham. I was staying on the ground 40 minutes with number four engine turn because Electra, that Electra didn't have an APU. Temperatures were 20 degrees, and I was happy as a king. I mean, just under the wing mm -hmm. with a number four engine turning, and I was listening to that music and saying, I'm the happiest <laughs> on earth because <laughs> <laughs> I'm freaking Alaska behind the, the wing of an Electra. It's part of my French. And uh, it was truly amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I you. guess that explains the propeller that's in the room right now from the <laughs> propeller, from the Electra. <laughs> <laughs> um, we ran out of time, unfortunately, for the questions, but you're more than welcome to. Um, no, uh, have we got a, one quick, last one there. You want to cut the last one? Go yeah. ahead then. All right. Hi. Um, so you mentioned working, you, you mentioned work isn't just about working but it's also about being good to your team. So what are some simple ways to treat your team well? Uh, don't do anything to anyone that you wouldn't like to receive in reciprocation. Treat people just like you would like to be treated. That's a rule of thumb, it's very easy. So don't be harsh. Try to listen well before you speak and uh, treat people respectfully. You start with that. And I mean, let people commit one, two errors, and then sack them. Just get them out of the way. I love what's written on top of uh, Ted Turner's desk. He had this little placard. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. I, I really love that. I mean, you either lead or you follow or you just get out of the freaking way. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the regards so we could get answer all the questions that um, you guys had. Um, thank you, Pena, for you know, have, uh, being here. Thank you for your effort. Thank you for putting this presentation. Thank you for your time, which is a really scarce asset nowadays. Um, before we close out, I wanted to ask you a final question um, to um, close out. What is aviation for you? Today? My life. Everything. Everything. I... I I can't imagine myself without having uh, some sort of connection with aviation. I, I even got married at Congoyans Downtown Airport in Sao Paulo. It was my wife's idea, but we got married at Downtown Airport. It's like going to New York and having your wedding at LaGuardia Airport. That would be <laughs> <laughs> as awkward as that. But it is still 100% my life. I, um, if the day comes when I can't have anything to do with aviation, consider me God. Thanks for sharing that. Before we close out, um, I'm gonna give you a chance just to also um, give your thanks to the crowd and just make a really small announcement after that. So, if you wanna address the crowd. Well, guys, thanks for having me here. I know it's late. You should be with your families, in your homes, just doing better things than listening to this crazy guy from South America. But truly, we have something in common. We are birds of a feather. We love this business so much that everything that we invest in aviation, you're gonna feel as you start your career is that everything you spent, everything you invested will come double or treble or four times because this is one magic industry. I never regret anything regarding aviation. Just like being here with you guys today. Thank you so very much to each one of you. Thank you very with all my heart. Thank you. Thank you. And the last thing um, that I wanted to bring up to you, it's actually a gift. It's not a gift from me. It's a gift actually from the Embryo community. It's a gift from the board of directors. It's a gift from the faculty members, the students, on, a, on behalf of the university to you. I have it um, right here behind me, well, and what I can say in advance to you, it's a gift that has, that has everything to do um, with you. <laughs> Let's check that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's this. Who's this Probably guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's this guy? Thank you, yeah. thank you guys thank for you coming, so and I guess we'll see you on the next presidential speaker, so thank you all. You see the Tommy? That's me. Yeah. <laughs>